are going to be holding our church Bible study here now at 10 a.m. And then we will be following with our service at 11 a.m. We're live streaming here from Lord of the Harvest. In our Bible study, we've been studying on the healing ministry of Jesus. Let's open with prayer. Father, we pray, especially in this hour, for a release, Lord, of just your healing, your healing anointing in the church. Father, grant us grace, O oh God, uh, at this hour to really experience the fullness of Jesus, the healer. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. In Matthew 8, we've looked at that verse for several weeks now. We're just going to look at the quote from Isaiah 53, and then we're going to teach out of Isaiah 53 today. Jesus' healing and deliverance ministry is interpreted by Matthew this way in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew 8, 16, after Jesus has performed a series of healings, reads, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were oppressed of demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, so that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sins. So what Matthew does at this point is he interprets Jesus' healing ministry from Isaiah 53.4. We're going to go to Isaiah 53.4, but I want you to see something uh, clearly here that I've mentioned the previous weeks. This verse, which is normally applied uh, by believers and theologians to the fact that there is healing in the atonement of Jesus, is not being utilized here to show that there's healing in the atonement of Jesus. We're not saying there isn't healing in the atonement of Jesus, but this is Jesus' present healing ministry. His present healing ministry is described that he takes our infirmities or our weaknesses and he bears our sicknesses. And probably the infirmities has to do with demon possession, the sicknesses has to do with physical healing. So what we want to do is we want to go back to Isaiah 53 because Isaiah 53 is powerful. It's a powerful testimony of the suffering servant who Jesus Christ modeled his ministry after. Isaiah 53 is a prophetic foreshadowing of the ministry of the suffering servant. So let's go there. And actually, there are what is known as the servant songs uh, that begin in Isaiah 40. And, and run through this point in Isaiah 53. There are four servant songs, and this is the fourth servant song. Uh, and it actually runs from 52.13 to the end of chapter 53, which is 53.12. So we're calling it Isaiah 53, but we're going to start in Isaiah 52.13. Now we have to understand the setting here. If you understand Daniel chapter 7, this fourth servant song in Isaiah 53 parallels Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, all these empires of the earth come before the ancient of days and demand the authority of heaven to rule in the earth. And the ancient of days rejects all of these great world empires, the, the greatest world empires in human history at that particular time, and gives the judgment it's a, it's, a, it's a courtroom situation. Uh, it gives the judgment from the ancient of days. God the Father, Yahweh, awards it to the Son of Man. This in Isaiah 53 is a similar scene. It's a heavenly courtroom. And the speaker starts out like this in 52.13. Behold! In other words, see! Look at this. And the speaker is not it's a divine speaker, and that Isaiah 53 is going to be another courtroom situation similar to Daniel chapter 7. What's happening here is evidence is presented for the suffering servant, just as evidence was presented for the Son of Man in Daniel 7. So the Lord speaking says, Behold my servant. Most translations say, shall rule wisely. 
But other translations will say, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will succeed. The reason for that is the Hebrew word for ruling wisely. It's, it's the word it's the word from Proverbs, from, from being wise. And when people live wisely, they succeed. So the first thing that the, 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 the Yahweh, the Ancient of Days, God the Father says, Behold, my servant will prosper because he embraces heaven's wisdom. The total effect, though, in the context is, behold my servant, my beautiful one. See, one who is wise, one who succeeds because of wisdom, and we're going to see wisdom, particularly in this fourth sermon song, is all about being obedient to the Lord, submitting to the Lord. That's what real wisdom is. He becomes the beautiful one. So he says, behold, my servant shall rule wisely, he shall succeed. He shall ascend, he shall be lifted up, and he shall be exalted. Now, the interesting thing is this also reminds us of another courtroom scene in Scripture. Remember, in the book of Job, the Lord says he's got all the sons of God, the, the angelic beings of the heavenly council gathered around his throne. He says, have you seen my servant? Job. Well, we know what that means for Job. It meant disaster because Satan's going to contend. And the moment Jesus, this is Jesus, this is an Old Testament prophecy foreshadowing Jesus as a suffering servant, the moment Jesus is extolled, the forces in the universe come into play. They gather into the court. Now, I like the threefold setting here. He shall ascend, which is, that's what a king does. A king ascends. Then not only shall he ascend, he shall be lifted up. He shall be carried up. He shall be born. And there was interesting about being born on the wings of eagles as he's ascending into the heights to receive his kingship. That's the same word that's used all throughout Isaiah 53 for the suffering servant, bearing the sins of the men. He bears our sins, but as he bears our sins, God bears him up. And see, this is what obedience always equates with us. When we obey the Lord, the Lord bears us up. When we bear his burdens, he bears us up. He shall be, he shall ascend, he shall be borne up, he shall be exalted. And the word for exalted here in the Hebrew, the parallel word in the Greek New Testament is remember Jesus when he humbles himself to death in Philippians 2, the Lord says he will exalt him. The one who humbles himself is the one who will be exalted. The next verse is, 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 is a difficult verse, but we, we go right into the kind of Job pattern here. From Look at him, he's beautiful too. The next verse says, just as many were dismayed over you, so maltreated, the word can also be disfigured. No longer human was his appearance and his form not like the form of a human being. So shall he sprinkle many peoples. Over him, kings will shut their mouths. Truly what they had not been told, they will have seen. And what they have never heard, they will have understood. We move immediately from this exalted one to this disfigured one. And we see the humility and the exaltation. Disfigurement, you know, that's, that's such a foreshadowing of, of what happened to Jesus when he, was, when he went to the cross. I mean, he was, he was brutally treated even before he carried the cross. So there's this contrast. And then it says, because of this contrast, many were astonished by you. By astonished, it almost means many were, were, were uh, explosively upset and afraid. Mm. To see the exalted one, and then you figure the exalted one is going to be a king, the exalted one is going to be a prince, the exalted one is going to be a, a wealthy man, the exalted one is going to be an educated man, a man of power, and then all of a sudden the exalted one is disfigured. And, and, and then as the, 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 the 
the heavenly speaker says this, all of a sudden, here comes the kings. The kings come. He's going to sprinkle many nations, and that sprinkling has to have purified. He's going to sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouth at him. Now, this particular section of Isaiah, uh, it prophesies about the, the period of the Persian kings. And it was a common gesture when the king would come forth that people would shut their mouths in honor of the great king. Shutting their mouths means in spite of this, this look that is so contrary to the first announcement of God, they're going to honor him as the king. They shall shut their mouths for that which was not told to them, they will again see, see as, as 52.13 says. What they have not heard, they will understand. And see, remember, this is the book of Isaiah, and this is kind of a reversal from the start of Isaiah. We spoke in this class, we've talked about Isaiah's call in Isaiah 6, and it said, seeing they will see and not understand. Hearing they will hear and not perceive. But now they're going to see, they're going to understand, because the suffering servant is going to cause the will of the Lord to prosper. Now remember, this fourth song starts with, See, my beautiful servant, let's see where it ends. We go into Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? Who has believed the thing that we've spoken? Remember, this is a courtroom situation still. And so the voice, the heavenly voice is saying, Who has believed what we've proclaimed, what we've spoken? And that's, of course, the, the same story today with Jesus. Jesus came. He fulfilled Isaiah 53. No one expected the Messiah to be that way, even though Scripture here testifies of this. You know, even at the time of Christ and before Christ, the, 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 the Jews grappled with this passage. Who the heck is the prophet Isaiah speaking of? And they did not necessarily equate it with the Messiah. And you know that when Jesus spoke to his disciples and, and he told his disciples on numerous occasions in the second half of his ministry, the Son of Man was going to be crucified. He was going to be mistreated. He was going to be tortured. And then he was going to die for their sins. The disciples said, no, Lord. The disciples were depressed. The disciples were perplexed. They don't understand the answer to the Jewish question. Who's, who is this, 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 this person that's being spoken of in Isaiah 53 was the Messiah? So who has believed our report? Who has given credibility to our report? And we're going to see one of the issues with the people in Isaiah 53 is it's that they're, 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 they don't give credibility that this could possibly be the servant of the Lord. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Now remember what the arm of the Lord is. The arm of the Lord was the mighty arm whereby the Lord delivered the people from Egypt. It's the mighty arm where the Lord does signs and wonders. The arm of the Lord is the, is the picture of the Lord is a warrior. Uh, it's, it's really interesting because there's, when, when you study the text, there's this tension in it because it's really clear that the suffering servant is a man of peace. He is not a man of war. I mean, everything about this passage says he's a man of peace, not a man of war. But at the start, the arm of the Lord, that's the warrior dimension of God. So let's, let's see exactly what that suggests. Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, he's a man of peace. But his Father in heaven is making war for him. You see, this is what we have to understand in the church our whole spiritual warfare mentality makes us want to pull out our swords and cut people's heads off. But we have to be careful about that spiritual warfare mentality that dismisses people, that goes after people. Scripture says we war not against flesh and blood. Powers and principalities in the heavenly places. But could spiritual warfare mean that as we become men and women of peace, of God's shalom, of God's blessing, even wanting to bless our enemies, that God makes war for us while we make his peace on the earth. That appears to be 
what is being suggested. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? This is, this is going to be a, a revelation. This is going to be something that takes revelation knowledge. 53.2 says, But he grew up like a young shoot in the presence of the Lord, and like a root out of dry land. He had no form, no beauty, that we should look at him, and no appearance that we should have this, uh, desired him. Now there's this contrast between what the Lord sees and what we see. And we have to understand this, this picture of Jesus, the one who himself takes up our infirmities and bears our diseases, bears our sicknesses, because we're moving toward verse 4, which is where that, that verse is going to be quoted. That one doesn't look like we would expect him to be. And that's the thing. There's, there's one of the great premises that comes out of Jesus' messianic ministry, particularly out of Isaiah 53, is God doesn't do things the way we think they should appear to be. Always remember, true walking in the Spirit. Now, there will be times of great victory and, you know, things will be clearly manifest to the Lord. But again, we, we, we have to be careful that we refrain in the church from this triumphalistic attitude, which means God always works it out the way we think he should work it out. We're already starting to see people perishing because of this coronavirus. We're seeing brothers and sisters in Christ who've lost their lives. And that can be very, very perplexing to people. But we need to understand Jesus Following him isn't a magic wand. You don't just declare something and it happens. Now, if the Lord speaks it to you and you declare it, it will happen. But we have to understand that there is this tension, this contrast between how the suffering servant appeared and what was really being accomplished behind the scenes. The thing about it is Jesus trusted in his Father implicitly. He did nothing of himself. Nothing of his own initiative. He didn't say, I, I, Father Billy, you know, I, I don't like the way you're doing this. I think it should be this way. Who would have thought that God would demonstrate his love for the world by sending his son to the creation he loves, and the creation he loves puts him to death, he despises him, rejects him. But yet, this is how God's purposes are fulfilled. We come to verse 3. He is despised, abandoned of men, a man who knows pain, a man who knows sickness, and we hid our faces from him. Interesting. It says he's a man of pains, and that particular word, pain, is the word that was associated with the oppression of the children of Israel in Egypt. He embraces the history of his people. He enters into solidarity with people who are oppressed. He understands sorrow. He understands pain. This is what it means that he takes our infirmities upon himself and he bears our sicknesses. It's not just that Jesus does that in the atonement. He does. But he's doing it as he goes through Israel and ministers to people. And we need to understand. We, we tie uh, Matthew 8, 17 in with Colossians 1, 24. True pastoral leadership. In other words, the shepherd heart of God is that we embrace people in their suffering. We embrace people in their weaknesses. See, Jesus was in solidarity. Remember, Jesus didn't come as a movie star. Jesus didn't come as a, a, a millionaire sports figure. He didn't come as a king. He didn't come as a president. He didn't come as a wealthy businessman. He came as a poor man. And that was part of Jesus' solidarity with the people who were wounded and broken in the earth. He had solidarity with the wealthy. He had a solidarity with the, 
with the wise. They may not have solidarity with him, but he has solidarity with them. But he comes and he embraces oppression. He knows, and that the Hebrew word is experiential knowledge of their sickness. We hid our faces from him. And being despised, we certainly did not value him. He. And then we get to the verse, the fulfillment, uh, quoted in Matthew 18, 17. Surely he has borne our sicknesses. He has borne our pain. He has borne our, our sorrows. He has borne our sicknesses. He carried them. But we esteemed him. We esteemed him plagued. You know what that's the word for? Leprous. We, ex we esteem him the way we would esteem a leper. What's a leper? Coronavirus. Stay away from me. The lepers were the people of the coronavirus of COVID-19 of that day and yet he was made leprous. It's actually here that the rabbis got a title for the Messiah. They called him the leprous one. That was one of, one of the titles. He was a leper. We esteem that he was a leper. We esteem that he was stricken by God. He was struck by God. What does it mean to be struck by God? He was a stroke victim. Jesus, the Messiah, the suffering servant, looked leprous, looked like a looked like a, 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 a stroke victim, and he was afflicted. He he was he was the one who was just overwhelmed with tribulation and trouble. That's how we see him. And we see him because he's the one who bears our infirmities, bears our diseases. Matthew 18, 17. He was pierced for our transgression. Crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our shalom, our peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Now it's interesting because several of the words for the, the key Hebrew words for sin are in this. Basically, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. And that word pierced has a secondary meaning, to be made unclean, to be desecrated. He was desecrated by our transgressions. Our transgressions, it's the, the Hebrew word that we're criminals. We're criminals. We're all criminals. And Jesus was pierced and desecrated because we're criminals. He was crushed. For our iniquity, smitten because of our perversity. That's the Hebrew word for per perversity. The chastisement of our shalom was on. Chastisement there is the word that's used in Proverbs for instruction of wisdom. We become wise because we're instructed by discipline. And the, the Hebrew word for instruction and its connection to discipline, it's not talking about um, just a, a, a gentle rebuke. The discipline that's spoken of is, is significant discipline, but that's the discipline that leads us to be wise. And see, by Jesus submitting himself to God the Father, while God the Father disciplined him, while he was paying the price for what we owed God, he became wise. The chastisement of our shalom was on him. We received the blessing of God because chastisement was upon Jesus. Another translation, the rebuke leading to our healing lay on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now this is very interesting. The Hebrew word for wounds, the background of the Hebrew word for wounds, there, there are different uh, meanings in it, and one of it is to be a snake charmer. The discipline of his wounds. Do you understand that the Messiah is a snake charmer? And see, a lot, I, I, I read a, a commentary by Klaus uh, Baltzer on, on this particular section in Isaiah. I, I spent hours in it last night. I was just fascinated because he really got into the, the 
the Hebraic background and see he made a parallel between the life of Moses and the suffering servant. There is a real parallel, even the words that are used uh, all, all through the uh, Lord raising up Moses to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt and then all through the wilderness wanderings. But remember what happened in the wilderness when poison serpents came forth and the people were bitten and they were perishing and the Lord told Moses to raise up a bronze serpent and whoever would look on that serpent would be healed. Jesus is the snake child. Do you understand that? When we're being destroyed by demon power, when we're being destroyed by, by, by sin, Jesus is the snake charmer. His wounds charm those snakes because when we look at him, we are healed. Let's look to Jesus in this hour and be healed. The second meaning, the second meaning behind this word is not only does it mean a snake charmer, but it has to do with, with fellowship. It has to do with woundedness, has to do with connecting people with each other to form a fellowship, to form companionship, to form friendship. So the Lord's wounds, how he heals us is that he's a snake charmer, we look to him, and he brings us into fellowship with himself and with each other. The translation says, he was desecrated for our sins, smitten because of our transgressions, the rebuke leading to our healing lay on him. And through his fellowship, the fellowship with his wounds, we have received healing. Remember what Paul said last week. He said, I fill up what is lacking in the body of Christ through what? Suffering. My suffering. See, there's, there's, when we're wounded, we release the grace and the healing grace of the Lord. That's why one of the most important things as a pastor, a leader, is understand people will wound you. People will mistreat you. People will lie about you. People will come against you. And when their wounds, when, when, when what they say opens up wounds in us, we need to let healing flow out of that wound. We don't attack. We don't retaliate. We say, as our wounds are bleeding, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And do you understand that people may be healed by rebuke? but people may also be healed as we receive those wounds and submit to the Father and let the healing of Jesus fill up what's lacking in the body of Christ. Do you know there are times when people have accused me falsely? I know it's false. I know there may not even be an ounce of truth in what they say. And you know what I say? Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that you shared that. I, I don't fight back. I don't retaliate. That's when you release healing to people. Now, those people may leave. You might not see them for years, but God's grace has been imparted on them. There are times for rebuke. We understand there's times for rebuke. There are times for correction. But there are times when people are out the door and they want to make sure as they're out the door, they wound you. You hurt me. How dare you? And I'm going to hurt you back. Let the, let the, the wounds release healing. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have each one turned to his own way, and the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. We understand that this perversity that's in our hearts is placed upon Jesus. We all wander around like a herd of small cattle, reading Balzer's translation. Each has taken his own way, but Yahweh has allowed to fall on him the guilt of, its all, of us all. Guilt is a debt. You have to understand, when somebody says you're guilty of a loan, it means you have a debt to pay that loan back. Guilt is a debt. We have a debt to God because of our sin, but Yahweh allowed to fall on the suffering servant the guilt of all of us. He was oppressed and he was bowed down but he does not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is dumb before his shearers. Let me find the next page here in my uh, cell phone. So 
So he opens not his mouth. You, you, you need to understand that, that Jesus does not justify himself. Stop and think of this. How many hours a day do we spend justifying ourselves to others? Jesus keeps his mouth shut. He knows the Father is the one who's going to justify him. He has been taken away from prison, from justice. Who thinks about his generation? He was completely removed from justice. To understand the crucifixion, Jesus, by being crucified unjustly for political reasons and religious reasons, the Jews sentenced him to death because they claimed he was blasphemous. The Romans sentenced him to death because they claimed he was seditious. What does Jesus do? He, his death, he identifies with all the political prisoners who have ever suffered in the earth. He identifies himself with all the people who have ever been falsely accused. He identifies himself with all the poor who have don't, don't have the money to get, a, to get a big lawyer to get them out of prison. Powerful, powerful demonstration. He's removed from justice, but we know he's going to bring justice. Who thinks about his generation? Truly, he's cut off from the land of the living because of the sins of his people, a blow has struck him. And he gave him, the Lord gave to him, the suffering servant, his grave among criminals and his place beside a rich man. Now that's, that was specifically fulfilled in the death of Jesus. At dying a criminal's death, he was supposed to be given a criminal's burial. And you know where most criminals were buried? In Gehenna. Gehenna, which is a biblical imagery of gay hinnom, of, of hell, hellfire. Gay hinnom was the valley of the sons of hinnom. And it was a place outside of Jerusalem. It was a garbage pit where the corpses of the poor and the criminals were thrown and burned. So that's where Jesus should have been buried. But then remember, Joseph of Arimathea intervenes and puts him in a rich grave. And what Isaiah 53 is prophesying is Jesus' death is for all. It's for the poor and the wealthy. He's identifying with both of them. Although he had not committed any act of violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, we get to verse 10, but Yahweh was pleased to crush him, to make him sick, to afflict him. It was God's will to do this. Why? Because he was taking and paying the penalty and the debt that we owe. And while some translations say it was the will of the Lord, it actually says in the Hebrew, he was pleased to crush him. He was pleased to smite him. If you shall make his soul a guilt offering, Jesus' soul became the guilt offering, the offering that paid our debt. If you shall make his soul a guilt offering, and of course we know that God the Father did, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. A man who dies, what happens to his inheritance? What happens to his seed? Well, Jesus is going to have an incredible seed. So there's, there are all these things that when, when people would read Isaiah 53 in its historical context, and remember, we're talking about something prophesied over 500 years before Jesus would even be born. There, 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 there's, how, how can a man whose, whose life is, is, is ripped away, how will he see his seed? How will he receive his inheritance? How shall the purposes of the Lord prosper in his hands? Well, we know death and resurrection. It's a prophecy not only of the death of Christ, but an implicit uh, recognition of his resurrection. He shall see the fruit of the travail of his soul. He shall be fully satisfied. He'll be satiated. It's like, it's like, it's like he, he'll be filled to the fullness with, with the, the most incredible meal that has ever taken place. So in spite of the fact of all of this mistreatment, all of this misunderstanding, all of this horror that comes upon the suffering servant, 
powerful, mighty, wonderful things are going to take place. When we say that Matthew 8, 17, he himself took our infirmities and he bore our diseases, is also a pattern for true apostolic and pastoral leadership. We mean that our suffering will release great blessing for people. Anyone who does not have a desire to suffer, anyone who does not have a heart to suffer, anyone who is not prepared to suffer, the ministry is not the place where you want to go. This is the pattern. This is the pattern. I mean, we look at Paul's, Paul's life, testimony in the epistles, and basically Paul, I mean, he, he accomplished incredible things. Incredible things. I mean, just, just supernatural miracles, signs, wonders, heavenly visions, many coming to the Lord, church planting, all these signs of an apostle, but do you recognize that when Paul talks about his life, he minimizes those things, he maximizes, oh, by the way, you guys, I suffered this, and I suffered this, and I suffered this, and I suffered this. When we look at Jesus, we see it in the Gospels speak clearly, clearly of, of all the incredible things he's done, but his... Uh, the Gospel of Mark is called a, an extended passion story. But the whole point, the Gospel of Mark is everything Jesus does is surrounded by suffering, and then it concludes with his suffering. And again, brothers and sisters, when you see the pattern being fulfilled in Paul, you don't teach, oh, yeah, Jesus suffered, so we don't ever suffer at all. No, Jesus suffered, as Peter says, to leave us a model we are going to live our lives in ministry. Wow. He shall see the fruit of the travail of his soul. He shall be fully satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will make many righteous, and he will bear their iniquities. After the trouble or anguish of his soul, he shall see, remember what this all started with? See my servant, see him. Well, and at the end of it, it's, and see him. He shall see and be satisfied. God the Father will be satisfied. The suffering servant will be satisfied because he's going to see his seed. He's going to see his inheritance. He's going to pass his inheritance on to many. God's purposes are going to prosper through the wise one who was obedient in all things. And everyone's going to see. And see, we're coming to the closing of this. Remember, this is a courtroom situation. And he's saying, here's the evidence. Innocent. Here's the evidence. Assent. Here's the evidence. I'll bear him up. Here's the evidence. Exaltation. Really interesting here, the Hebrew word for to bear, which is constantly used throughout this passage, though bearing sin and bearing sickness. It's also used in Matthew 8, 17. He took our infirmities upon himself and he bore our diseases. The Hebrew word nasa, which means to bear, is also the Hebrew word for a prince. When scripture talks about the prince, the coming prince, which is a reference to the Messiah, the prince is the one who bears the sin and the sicknesses of God's people. And we conclude with this powerful Powerful. He, he, because of his knowledge, because of his experience, he, the righteous one, now he's called the righteous one, will make many righteous. So it's the revelation of who the suffering servant is when we see him, when we turn to him and we become healed from our snake bites. We are made righteous by the Lord. Because of all of this, I will divide the inheritance to him with the many and with the many he will divide the spoil because he poured out his soul to death and he was counted with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The three Hebrew words for sin, the main three words are mentioned here. The word for being criminals, the word for being perverse, and the word for missing the mark. And Jesus, the suffering servant, deals with all of them. But this is what, this to me is the coup de grace. And uh, I, I'm going to close. 
I've got three or four minutes here to close so we can set up for the service. He bore the sins of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. Do you understand Jesus' life and death was intercession? It wasn't that Jesus lived and taught and suffered and prayed. His very life became intercession because to, to, to intercede means we stand between God and man and plead on the behalf of man and ask for God to release blessing to others. When we talk about what we need to be doing in this hour, we need to be praying and praying and more praying. Oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in my house. I'm in lockdown. I'm rarely coming out. I don't know what to do. Pray, pray, and pray more. Amen. You understand our Thursday night prayer meeting now is going to be, we're going to be doing it on Zoom. We're going to be doing it online. We're going to be doing it every Thursday night at 7. If you want to be part of that, let me know. Email the office. Text me because you have to get a Zoom invite to get to that. But we need to be praying every Thursday as a church online. Every leader, everybody here in the church, we need to get on that and we need to pray. Because right now, we, our lives have to be, we have to be the intercessors. We have to stand between God and human, human beings, good, bad, believers, non-believers, righteous, unrighteous, anywhere in the world. And we need to plead with God. This is why Jesus' fourfold ministry, his life and death, that's one aspect of Jesus' ministry, his ascension is the second aspect. Actually, it's his life and teaching, that's, that's one aspect of his ministry. His death and resurrection is another aspect of his ministry. He, his ascension is an aspect of his ministry, and the fact that he lives to make intercession. For us. Jesus has a current ministry. Teaching, life, death, resurrection, ascension, those all took place in the past. But his current ministry is he's an intercessor, and that's the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah 53. The suffering servant is a man with his hands raised in the air, petitioning God for the people. His, when he suffers, he's making intercession. When he teaches, he's making intercession. When he says nothing but lives in obedience to the Lord, he's making intercession. He's a healer because he's making intercession for God's people. And so the real ministry of bearing the infirmities of the people and bearing up the diseases and releasing people from demon power and sickness is that we are all called to be living intercessors obeying the Lord by becoming suffering servants as he is. So Father, we come before your throne in Jesus' name. This is powerful. I mean, Lord, I just scratched the surface of something that is so powerful. Such a powerful passage. Be with us, Lord. Move on us mightily. In this hour, Lord, use your church to be like Jesus. Use your church and may people see in, in, in the courtroom of the drama played out in human history right now. May they see us and say, behold, those who act wisely. Behold, those who prosper and succeed because of their obedience and their faith. Behold, those who are the beautiful ones of the Lord, bringing his shalom and his beauty in the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, for those of you who are watching, we will uh, take a 10-minute break, and we'll be back for our live stream sermon. God bless you.